what I also found was that when an individual shared their story with me afterwards, many people would say, wow, like you're the only one I've told, or I haven't told many people this. And it felt really nice to share that. Welcome back to another episode of Girls Gotta Eat. Welcome back and fuck you, Brennan. <laughs> We're not allowed to say that anymore. You guys bombed us with these no, emails. People, they validated us. There was four emails that cool Brennan. No, there was you one didn't read bad. deep enough. <laughs> you did not. I read every one. You caught me. We, listened, we re-listened to an old episode recently and we'll get to why. Okay. Spoiler alert, it's Dale Moss. Dale Moss is in the news and he's a former guest. We're going to spill all the tea we have on Dale coming in hot. But in that episode, your dad came up. You said something about your dad and I go, oh my God, this is the first time we brought up your dad in that episode. And because we always we used to talk about your mom. Oh yeah, because she so was like the star of the podcast. For me to listen to that and say, oh my God, we never talk about your dad when literally all we've done recently is talk about your dad. It was a very funny thing to hear. I remember that episode so well because like I was like, oh, I have, I have a dad. Like surprise, I have a dad. Because <laughs> yes, my yes. mom was like the third host of this podcast. And then also like, it was like, I never had a mom again. We never talked about my mom ever again. <laughs> Um, all right, guys, really quick up top. We just want to say this episode is about abortion. We just want to let you know that it is a episode filled with a lot of factual information, statistics. We have a doctor. She is a new author named Mira Shaw, and we stuck to a lot of facts. We talk about some things politically, but it's really more of discussing abortion as opposed to a lot of emotion and opinion surrounding it. So I think you guys know where we stand and we'll dive into this further during the interview. Uh, you know that we are pro-choice, but we can certainly respect a difference in opinion, especially when it comes to a woman and how she feels about her own body. What we are not okay with is obviously when someone forces their belief system on others and it impacts them in a negative way for choices that they should be able to make on their own. You guys know what we mean. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to say that if you are someone who believes life because begins at conception, I don't want you to worry that we are going to criticize that belief in this episode. You wrap that up in a nice little bow. Thanks. Um, you guys know that like on this podcast, we just want to be supportive of most of your lifestyle choices. Um, and this one obviously is a sensitive subject and I'm really proud of this interview because I think we really did take a lot of our emotions and opinion out of it. It's a lot of straightforward facts and she's so great, this doctor. And of course, Ashley and I are pro-choice and pro whatever you guys want to do with your own bodies and not judging what other people do with their bodies. And um, we will talk about this later, but we, we have not had abortions. So um, we're right. not discussing an experience that her and I had. Um, so I was excited to have a doctor to discuss that on the show. Yeah. So anyway, just got to let, got to let you know up top if it's a topic you don't want to hear about right now. Um, I, encur I encourage you to listen to the intro because I think it's going to be a hot one. But, you know, always just got to let you guys know. Also, I'm a doctor now. You know, like I'm a brain doctor. Uh, oh, yeah. You're a neurologist. Yeah. People were really into that. Dr. Greenberg. Yeah. Um, I talked about the hippocampus last week. Yeah. You did. Um, and all those. Uh, I don't remember any other words I said. Frontal lobe. Amygdala. Uh, amygdala yes, is my amygdala. personal fave. Uh -huh. is, what's um, your fave? Um, cerebellum. No, your hippocampus. <laughs> you hit that word so hard. Hippocampus. And when it gets to the say. hippocampus, <laughs> when you're in trouble. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you something funny that just happened. Okay. So we got a little bit of a late start today because as you guys know, I use the Peloton in my building and I, it's usually nobody's on it. I usually go down there, the bike is open and I just hop right on. I go down there today. I was going to start my workout at two and this guy is on it. And I was like, oh, what the fuck? So I walked in there and I was going to try to, you know, from a distance kind of get a vibe for how long of a workout he was doing. So I know when I could come back. When you say get a vibe for how long, that is not <laughs> where I thought this sentence was going. So hear me out. What's flopping around in those jean shorts? Yeah. In those uh, jean shorts. Jean that's, shorts. That's how often I work out. I'm like those jean shorts. Yeah. So I, but I, I realized that he's attractive so I got, I opened the door and I was like, Hey, do you, and he knew exactly what I wanted to know. Cause I had my cycling shoes in my hand and he was like, I'm only doing 20 minutes. And I was like, okay. So I'm like, I'll come back. Okay. I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's 
amazing. So I was like, I'll come back in at two twenty five, whatever. And I'm like, who is that dude? Like I'd never seen him before. Oh, he wasn't the guy that I like in your building. No, yeah, I got worried it was him. No, no, no. Maybe he lives in the South Tower. I'm not sure. I've never seen him before. And I was like, huh. But I couldn't get a vibe for really his stature, which is important to me as a tall woman. So when I went back down at two twenty five to get on the bike, he was gone. Okay. But his bike setting. <laughs> Told you how tall he was. No. So I ride at 26. Okay. His was at a 19. No. <laughs> Which is not that huge of a difference. Also, you have to explain to me what that means. <laughs> like, you, like the seat height. I just know that 26 is bigger than 19. So <laughs> seat height, right? <laughs> So I have very long legs. I'm a tall yes. person, but I just feel like I can't. But you're not tall a, for a man. I can't take a 19. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everybody listening to this is laughing because they know what you mean. And I'm laughing because I'm like, I don't know what that means. But he sounds little. But I mean, he could have a long torso and shorter legs, which I don't know if I want any part of that either. You know me, I like a long legged man. <laughs> Yeah, here are the huge torso. You know, I only watch Andrew Schultz's videos to look at those ankles. <laughs> that is a man with some long ass legs. I love his long legs and his big hands. Um, anyway, we know a lot of you guys aren't fans. It's fine. I like his body type. And I had this moment of like, that's my type. I am really out here investigating the height of his Peloton seat to see if he is height appropriate for me. This is important information. And it's like, I would go on LinkedIn to research if a guy really had a job, he told me. So like, of course you're looking at like the lowest hanging fruit to find out how tall he is. You're a tall person. And then guess what else I did? I forgot a hair tie. I was I was already clipped in. So I'm clipped in the bike. What does that mean? I, like my my shoes were already in there. Okay. I forgot a hair tie. I used my mask <laughs> and tied it around my hair. Bitch, I've done that before. <laughs> I've done that before. I have used the mask to tie my hair up. This is not weird. <laughs> I understand this. This is not weird. It was one of our special masks that uh-huh. we got from Jill Zarin and Ali Shapiro. They sell masks. Check them out. Mm-hmm. Um, go to Jill Zarin's shop. Uh, it worked really well. I just used the loops and like made it didn't work really well. It, it worked. My hair was greasy enough to hold itself up. <laughs> <laughs> I did walk in here and you were showering. <laughs> Cleaning that bee hole. Um, I have to tell you um, a tip, a tip that a listener emailed us. I was very excited. I asked you to please not read this email. Okay. Okay. All right. The title of this email is good tip for girls. I had to share. It was really short. We love your short emails. Please continue to submit short emails. Okay. I don't know if you're going to see this, but I had a good tip for girls. I told my dumbass boyfriend (laughs) in the, they've been there for four years. My dumbass boyfriend. Amazing. In the beginning of our relationship, that a girl is more likely to get pregnant if she doesn't come. So, like, if she doesn't get off, she might get pregnant. I made something up, like, yeah, when I come, your come can't go up. I'm on birth control and we are completely safe. My boyfriend has been pretty motivated to make me come for the last four years now, and he still believes this. If she doesn't come, she's more likely that they'll get pregnant. So she yes. told him this, so he makes her. He works hard to make her come. Yes, because like the muscles in your body that contract when you come make it so that you can't get pregnant. This, that's what she told. A, that's him. what she told him. Yes. That's not true, guys. That's not true at all. <laughs> that's a crazy thing, and the internet exists. That is so funny, and like you know, but like you know, you could tell like a twenty-one-year-old boy this, and they would believe you a hundred percent. And you could probably tell like a forty-one-year-old man this, and he'd probably believe you. <laughs> Uh, I just think this is so funny and I can like see that she just like told this like dumb 21 year old her dumb ass boyfriend and he's he was like, like I don't want to get her pregnant I got to make her come but doesn't that like I can see that making sense to some people yeah okay I love it I was proud you of said listener email and I just got to bring this one up because I wanted to also kind of offer a low-key apology about this okay. we got an email from a listener subject line buzz buzz balls <laughs> She said, I have a very important follow-up question regarding the episode with Beatrice Dixon. A few weeks ago in the episode, she talks about but like fluttering your lips on a guy's balls. Okay. Which we all said we were going to go home. We, we all said we were going to try. I haven't had a ball sack in my face well, since that episode. Hear me out. Okay. She said, my boyfriend of two years is pretty willing to try anything. I told him about this when he was excited, blah, blah, blah. But when I went to lip flutter, my lips just stopped. Which when you think about it, go ahead and try it right now. Flutter your lips and put the back of your hand to it. They just stop immediately. So the second you touch your lips, you stop fluttering them. Okay, so how does that work? So she goes, so anyway, after being stopped dead in my tracks, I still have my lips partly open from the attempted flutter and now I'm more so just blowing hot air on my boyfriend's ball sack. <laughs> Yum. Have either of you tried this yet? What am I doing wrong? LOL, thank you and I love you. We gave you bad advice. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't think of it logistically. And no, you can't flutter your lips on a pair of balls. Okay, I do have a tip, but it would never work. Okay, here's how, okay, it, all surfaces would have to be totally dry. If there's no moisture, I could see it not like, because your balls are not like your hand. Like they will sort of move. It's a sack. It's a hanging sack. But like your balls have to be not sweaty and your lips have to be not moist. And neither of those things are happening when you're like aroused. But even like, like try to even put your finger in your mouth and flutter your lips. You can't. But you can't do it. If anything is in, if if anything's touching, I can't do it. I'm That's, trying. Yeah. So we. Were, I wanted to apologize for any of you guys that were fluttering your lips on your boyfriend's balls. We gave you bad advice. <laughs> we, in our defense, we didn't say we'd ever done it. And also, it I'm probably gave, Beatrice. It probably gave you guys something fun to talk about with your boyfriend. But can you imagine when she said, "Now I'm more so just blowing hot air on my boyfriend's ball sack"? I lost it. Do you think after believe- my dad listened to that episode? <laughs> He asked his wife to do it. I actually can't believe we didn't hear about this from Bill first. I know that I gave him bad sex advice. He has been in like a tremendously good mood. Buzz, lately. buzz, Bill's balls. Yeah, I just think that like Bill's getting his balls buzzed. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, hot air blowing on them. Listen, he's in Texas. There's not much else to do there right now, okay? He's old. He can't go outside. Right. I support him getting his balls buzzed. I, this is, I'm down a road. I don't want to be down. Yeah, let's this just over you know for what? me. Um, but anyway, we want to do apologize to you guys. Uh, and while we're talking about the listeners, do you want to do our Brennan update? Yeah. Um, so never in the history of the podcast have we mentioned a name on the show and gotten so many emails talking about that person's name. I will say... No one's going to defend a Kyle or a Chad because I think that like traditionally, historically, those guys are terrible and I don't think anybody has any stories that would like surprise or shock anybody. But Brennan is like a really shocking one and we got tagged in a bunch of Instagram stories about Brennan. About Brennan. That girl's son. She had a cute so son Brennan. Cute. If you guys aren't familiar, we hope that you're listening to every episode, but just in case you're not, <laughs> whatever. Um, last week, we read this email from a listener. And by the way, you guys love that episode. Thank you so much. You really went crazy for the episode titled Your Man Who's Not Your Man. And a listener ended an email with saying, fuck you, Brennan. And we, it really caught on. I personally love it because of Step Brothers. Can't recommend that movie enough. <laughs> You know, it's old. Uh, and I also forgot about the line, Bren- Brennan has a mangina. <laughs> Remember, they all are chanting it. Well, didn't Jenny, J- Jenny, Jenny Jones. Jones, she's the one who said it. Um, but I want to read my favorite Brennan email. Okay. Dearest Ashley and Raina, I've only ever known one Brennan. I assure you, he was not cool. We met at summer camp where one day while in the sauna, he asked a small group of us if we had ever heard of the dark web. A couple years later, he was arrested for attempting to import illegal weapons and building pipe bombs in his basement. I've attached the news article for my receipt. (laughs) First of all, love, love anybody that sends a receipt. I think this girl is so smart. What, who is out here building pipe bombs? (laughs) <laughs> the next one she said her ex Brennan was okay except he did get upset when anyone brought up Step Brothers and said he had a mangina <laughs> also. <laughs> also he was a Taurus man and it showed but other than that he was a good Brennan and then this this one she said he wore a back brace on the outside of his clothes um, and then oh he should look up knee brace guy you think that it was for 100% you think it was for fashion or for function I wonder if knee brace guy is named Brennan and then one girl had a sister named Brennan, which I like the name for a girl. Love it. Love of course, it as always. Um, and then the last good one was just wanted to let you know that the only Brennan I know is a hardcore Trump supporter. So that's the Brennan update. It's a great Brennan update. You guys like really flooded the the emails and the DMs to just give us Brennan updates. Thank you so much. Yeah. We, we have an update on something. Our merch. We didn't forget to talk about it. <laughs> Do you want to talk about our stuff? Yeah, let's talk about our stuff. Uh, we have all new stuff. Uh, <laughs> we did a whole new brand um, glow up and we have gifts you guys use like crazy on the... My favorite... Okay, I think we're going to have the same favorite gift. My favorite gift is your leg spreading <laughs> up and down and up and down. You guys, that's how you know Rain is a true friend. What? You just like... My it favorite is. gift is you. Yes. <laughs> like you are, you're not being competitive with me about your gifts versus my gifts. There is a clear favorite. It is clearly the favorite. And we didn't think we were going to get to use that one because it like came in a little blurry the first yeah. time. So I didn't know we were going to be able to use it. It's just, it's the best gift. It works so well for everything. Yes. We love the website. Thank you guys for going and checking it on a desktop. Like we asked you to, that was so sweet. Uh, the merch, we had a few glitches. It was not our fault at all. Factors completely out of our control. And if you thought you were pissed, you couldn't buy merch. I guarantee you we were more pissed. <laughs> 
<laughs> we do have new merch. We have uh, we have robes, we have sleep masks, we have bomber jackets, tank tops, t-shirts. We have all kinds of really cool new stuff. We have a wine glass set that says the Ashley to my Raina and the Raina to my Ashley. Um, we should do Dewey merch. He's looking, Dewey, he's, he's, Dewey he's, just gave me a sad eye. I was like, why don't we have Dewey he's merch? He's like making noises. He's hungry. But we'll do Dewey merch. We really do want to get on some since March merch. So we still have more coming. We're working on it. Um, what were you going to say that you have an update on? I have an update on, well, the world has an update on it. And then I want you to give us some information about it. So um, the world found out that the newest bachelorette, Claire Crawley, um, who is also the oldest bachelorette, she has since dropped out of the show because she has fallen in love with our former guest and Ashley's ex, Dale Moss. Ah, shut up. <laughs> okay, you know what? Fine. Let's Ashley's finish. former boyfriend, Dale Moss. <laughs> my former man who's not, who was never my man. He's your man who's not your man. He walked in. To, he was one of our first guests. He walked in to the interview and I was like, I like t- I took the breath out of my yeah. lungs. He's so beautiful. Like I hadn't fully prepared you. <laughs> like, you know, there's just some people you look at and you're like, oh, you're supposed to be a model. Like God put you on this earth to be a model. So actually started dating him. Oh my God, shut <laughs> no. up. We already, we at that to, point we had broken up. No, but then you guys went out again. Oh, All right, we'll we get out, to it. Okay. But, but we we used to have this thing where like we like didn't know each other that well at the beginning of the podcast. And we were like, okay, like which one of us is going to fuck which guest? And so like that was, you, you were the clear front runner on that. Yeah, so I would just like to share my story about Dale because he's in the news right now. And- we encourage you guys to go back and listen to the episode. Summer 2018. It's called Still Not a Player. Great episode. He's a great guy. I have nothing but good things to say. My history with Dale was that we met at an event one night. Of course, I spotted him. Most beautiful man in the room. You know, he's tall. He, we, you guys know he played NFL football. He's a model. Um, and we really... Like, okay, you know I'm so confident. Like, probably more so. Like, I have, like, reverse body dysmorphia. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> but I still just wouldn't think a guy like that would be interested in me. And I'm also not saying that he was. But you see somebody like that, and you're like, we'll probably just be friends. You know what I mean? That's how I feel about your friend Tribble. I mean, you see him, and you're like... Yeah, he's I, not. I, I'm actually ultra confident around people like that because I'm like they would never they were, date Yes, me. so I don't have to even like put on a charade because I'm like oh you're not fucking me right, right. <laughs> so also I'm never really seeking out the hottest guy in the room ever funniest yes but it's, you know it's just not what I'm looking for so we actually really we met we were introduced um, by a friend of ours named Pavan and we sat down at the bar and we like shut the boy shut it down we just kept drinking margaritas we were we ordered food we had like a night where we like really got to know each other probably for a couple hours and i was like this guy's so wonderful and then he was like hey do you want to go to this event with me next week and i'm like sure i'm sure i'm gonna go to this event with you dale would you, but, wear, would you wear the event so <laughs> we'll get there like, yes and we alluded to this on the episode but we never really dove deep into like any sort of thing that he and i had which was not a thing it's a th- it was a thing that wasn't a thing so he invited me to this premiere this movie premiere event that was at Tao downtown and then I just was like I bet and then forgot about it day of the event I was out we had recorded uh and I went to meet my friend Raquel who also owns Sweet Beach in Atlanta she was in town for the Met Ball casual we went we had drinks and he's like hey do you want are you still coming to the event and I was like oh my god I was wearing like a crop jean like nothing fancy I had a backpack you're wearing high waters and you had a backpack. backpack I had a backpack and so I was like oh my god yeah of course I'm gonna go meet this guy so I get there, the girls that checked me in looked me up and down and I was like, hey, can I put my backpack in your <laughs> And then when I told them I was Dale's guest, they were like, you? Like, I can look so great. It just wasn't one of that. It wasn't one of those nights. Also, Tao is not a place to not look like. Okay, I interviewed a Tao. Movie premiere I'm gonna event you, at Tao. I'm going to tell you about Tao. I interviewed a Tao like 10 years ago to be a restaurant manager or something. And I was talking to them and they were like, okay, so one of our things here is that we actually, even if your table's ready, we make you wait an hour in the bar. And I was like, why? And they were like, it just makes people want it more. Right. Like, that's the kind of place Tao is. Like holding the line outside a club when you really don't even need to to give it the allure that like that's the place to be. Yeah. You so, can't yeah. bring back there. These girls were like, I was like, I'm Dale Moss's plus one. And, and they were like, I bet you are, sweetie. <laughs> also, can you store my backpack? I cannot. It was to me though, so it's fine. Um, so I feel so <laughs> underdressed. I really felt kind of I did feel a little self-conscious to be wearing jeans and like just a black cap sleeve bodysuit and all these people are super dressed up. Yeah, at a bouge fest in the fashion capital of the United yeah, States. So we yeah. like joked about it and stuff, but like I thought us I thought maybe he had other people with him. Like, no, it was just me and him. Like it was just us. And like we it felt dainty at points. But again, I still really don't think that it was. And we joked about this on our episode with him. So you know you can listen back. You decide for yourselves. But I do remember we went into this other kind of separate room. They had a bunch of sushi out. We had, we were there kind of just off to ourselves, sitting on like a couch, having drinks, eating sushi and like really talked 
for an hour or two, just one-on-one. And like we were talking about family stuff and opening up about some deeper topics. And he really is such a genuinely kind person. And when you talk to him, he's so engaging. He listens. He looks you in the eye. He like looks into your soul. Like I say this to tell you that I don't know Claire Crawley. I don't know what she's like as a person, but I know Dale. And for somebody on The Bachelorette that pr- meets a lot of guys that probably skew a little narcissist, that probably are just out for fame, if you meet him and you connect with him because of who he is as a person and how he makes you feel when you talk to him, like I can 100% get how she fell in love with him. Wow, you really sound like you're over the breakup. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I hate you. I am telling the listeners my experience. I definitely didn't fall for him. I, no. We walked out that night. We did an Instagram story. I didn't even go home and like think about it anymore. I was like, you I didn't masturbate at all to it. I just felt like we, I still even yeah. I even to connect and not on that level. I still felt like it was a friend vibe. Yeah, I promise. I'm just joking. Dale, I and I co-signed everything Ashley said. I think that he is really one of the sweetest men that we've ever had on the podcast. He won't say a bad word about anybody. His eyes are so beautiful. I go swimming in them. Like, yeah. He is a wonderful person to be around. And like, I would watch those two fuck because he is beautiful. Yeah. I also texted him. I got a little update for us. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Can you just tell me my phone? Oh my God. I'm so excited. Yeah. I checked in with him the other day. I said, (laughs) I said, hey, our DMs are blowing up about you. Smiley face. Hope all is well and excited to see you on TV soon. I want him to know that I wasn't digging for information. Uh Like that's not... He's not going to give it to me, and I want to like respect that, obviously. Well, I want him to give it to you. I'm glad you dug for me. He said, hey, hey, lots of rumors out there, but should be an interesting season. Hope you're doing well. I had people hitting me up like crazy about the podcast last few days once I got my phone back. Because you know you can't have your phone. Uh Uh-huh. Of course, you guys were fucking in those DMs, you little sluts. I love you, little sluts. I love you guys. Every man that we have on the show, you guys slide in. So go listen to the episode. We're obviously tuned into the season. And then did you even mention that basically Claire quit and then they're bringing in Tasha to replace her mid-season, which is unprecedented. I would know. I've seen every season. This has not I, happened before. I mean, you know, I only watch Jared Freed's recaps of The Bachelor. Raina so just started watching The Bachelor when Jared started live screaming. I, it's all I do. I actually, I sent Ashley uh, Sean Lowe last week and um, she was like, that's not news because that's, um, he has 14 kids with the person he married from The Bachelor at this point. So can you, not can you guys please post a story of Raina and Sean Lowe and d- d- do the hot take gif over it? <laughs> Like it's like Laundra as you. I was like sending Ashley all of his Instagram story posts, and she's like, "Yeah, I've seen this before." Um, so this is not a hot take. This is unprecedented gossip. I love this. I am living for this. And then I, I didn't watch it, but I saw the chicks in the office who we love, and we've we've uh, been on their podcast. They had Nick Vial on, and he was like, "This could all be like producers. You never know. The bachelor, the bachelor people are like oh, the best at what they do. Yes, absolutely. Um, the only people that work harder than Chris Jenner, in my opinion. But this is going to be crazy. Like if. She, her and Dale fall in love. Then they leave right off into the sunset. And then Tasha just comes in and I'm, I'm assuming, and then has the same guys. Like they're not recasting. Like she's just gonna, they're just gonna like fucking flip flop it. I mean, those guys are just there for Instagram followers. So they don't care who's on the show to get the Instagram followers for them. Do you think Tasha's going to be like, I want a Dale. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone on earth would get there and be like, I wanted Dale, the hottest man on earth. Dale is one of the best looking men I've ever shared breathing air with. <laughs> Sounds like you're not over it. <laughs> <laughs> Can you see the headline now? G- g- pathetic girls gotta eat co hosts in love with Dale Moss. <laughs> <laughs> no, no one would write about us. <laughs> And I love it because, I mean, God, if I would have known Dale was into older women, I would have tried to hit it harder. I wish you would have had sex with Dale Moss. Ugh. I wish one of us would have had sex with Dale Moss. Anyway. I'd still do it too. He just wasn't in like, he just wasn't like in the right headspace for a girlfriend when we met. You know what I mean? Because you were wearing a backpack. <laughs> <laughs> no guy has ever fucked a girl with a backpack. <laughs> Bitch, I put the backpack down before I even saw him. It was in the color. You showed up with a big backpack energy he can smell it on your body (laughs) one of the hostess is a towel slid into his dms i was like hey you don't know me (laughs) but the girl that just showed up for you had a backpack (laughs) i can't breathe breathe. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. Like one of those, one of those like PR interns who checked me in was like, oh, fuck no. That girl's not going to get with Dale Moss. I'm gonna Bad alert, for I'm alerting him about the backpack immediately. And what are her jeans? <laughs> She's like, you don't know me, oh. but um, this girl's bad for your image. They were like a strong mom jean. I, I know the jean. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh my gosh. Okay. Dale T, <sighs> Brennan update. Um, we had puppies named after us. <laughs> Ashley continuously sent this to me and I paid no attention. And then I was like... <laughs> I was like, I can't believe this dog's name Raina. And you were like, yeah, I've been sending you this stuff. You've been getting tagged in it. I've been DMing you, I've been texting you. And then I like really dove in. And I was like, oh my God, there's like a dog named Raina. They named dogs after us. So Muddy Paws Rescue, don't DM them. They're full. <laughs> <laughs> um, I met this girl named Julie one time at a rescue event. And she is a follower of Girls Gotta Eat. She approached me. It was like, I love the podcast. And we, 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 there was like a dog that day that looked like Dewey. So we were like bonding over that. And she messaged me and was like, we got three new puppies in or they're on the way. They rescued them from somewhere in the South, I think. And she said, we're naming them Ashley, Raina, and Meryl. <laughs> <laughs> and then she sent three photos and I was like, can I just know which is which? Because like, Meryl wasn't as cute. What I had, I would have had to know. Ashley and Raina were the cutest. Yeah, the cutest. Yeah. Sorry, Meryl, you're not the host of the show. Right. So. Exactly. That, that's. I feel like Julie knew that. Like, you're not going to make whatever. All puppies are cute. All babies are beautiful. No, they're not. But no, like, they're not. Like, you just give you get the ugliest one, the sidekick name. Right. And Meryl was fine with that. Yeah. Meryl doesn't care. But then Meryl was just happy to be there. I noticed that the pe- then they were they're fostered for a couple weeks, and I noticed that Raina's foster parents are posting about her on Instagram. Ashley is nowhere to be found. <laughs> so you see a Raina, you scoop her up. So I messed. <laughs> Not the, men. The, co- the comments are so funny. That baby Raina. Baby Raina is adjusting. <laughs> and so I messaged Julie. I'm like, hey, I noticed Raina's foster has been posting. And I was just wondering <laughs> what's going on with Ashley. <laughs> Nothing gets by you. Like you couldn't just like enjoy your weekend. You had to check in with the shelter and be like, "Why is the Raina dog doing better than mine?" No, I just wanted to see her. I mean, I feel so honored to have these puppies named after oh, us. Too. So honored. So I still haven't gotten an update, but I'm sure she's doing fine. All I could think about all week was like, what if you showed up at someone's house and they're like, "Hi, my name is Raina," and they'd be like, "Oh my god, what's your dog's name?" And you're like, "Raina." Like, yeah, that would be a crazy thing if someone named their dog after themselves. Totally. But now I'm going to. Um, we know that you guys like Rex from us every week. I don't have like a crazy amount of Rex. Ne- I am fully committed to watching um, Love on the Spectrum next week. Okay. Because um, Dylan said it's... God damn it. Ugh. Dylan gets more fucking airtime on this podcast than I do. Um, he said it's so sweet and wonderful and beautiful and sincere. He said, you have. He said dude, bro, you have to watch it. Yeah. Um, so I'm committed to that for next week. Do you want to commit to that? Well, I have... So we're recording this on August 6th, August 7th, tomorrow, Selling Sunset. So I... We're going to have to review that. But like... That takes precedence. We should, well, we're going to get there. Do Love it. Both. Okay. okay. What I watched last night, though, um, I watched Last Chance You which I know you love. Yeah. I watched the fifth season of it last night. The latest season. Yeah. Um, They're I in was, Oakland. Yeah. I, wow, you're so up to date on Last Chance You. I've watched a few. I didn't know it was five seasons. I thought it was a one season docu-series. I f- the threw it on last night. I was like, oh, oh I didn't really? Know. But I love, if you guys want to watch like a sports doc, it's really moving. It's with all these like underprivileged kids and you know, their stories and they're playing college football and I loved it. Yeah. It's the first two, I think are at the same school. Like, yeah. It, yeah, and then the... I forget the third season, the fourth season. I didn't love, and then that coach actually got in trouble. Oh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't love his energy. Um, and then this, this season five is good. Um, I like it. I'm fine. I, I used to like sports stuff a lot more. I find myself just liking it a little less. Like, I don't know. I think your tastes change. Yeah. Like, I just. Well, so I feel like we got inundated with all the 30 for 30 stuff. I've watched all of that. I've watched yeah. Schooled. I've watched like a million sports documentaries. Yeah. Um, and I also last week watched um, The Last Dance, which I thought was Save the Last Dance. For, I was calling it Save the Last Dance to a lot of people. They thought I was talking about the dance movie. Uh, but I watched yeah. The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. I just watched the first three episodes, but it was very good. Yeah, very well th- done. Those are two good ones. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, Last Chance You, Kate and I talk about that one a lot. That's one of her favorites. I will say like, Cheer is a similar vibe. It's like a last chance place. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of like yeah. the people that had to leave other colleges and universities for various reasons, or they have or have more troubled at home. They go to these places. So Cheer is the cheerleading of Last Chance You, and I just like I just liked it more. You did. I don't know. I don't know what it is. I used to watch so many sports stuff, like with an ex of mine, and I. 
You ever look back and you wonder, did I like him or did I like did watching I like it with him? No. <laughs> I genuinely enjoyed watching sports stuff with him when we were in a relationship. I wasn't pretending, but then I feel like, do you ever look back and you're like, was it just that we were sharing something together that on my own, I actually don't enjoy that much? Yeah, I feel like I enjoy certain people's commentary about stuff or enjoy knowing we're going to fuck when this is over. Yeah. And like, I'm doing it to make them happy. But like, I genuinely enjoyed watching Last Chance You season one or season two or both, uh-huh. I forget, like with him. And I am like, I don't know. I don't know if this is for me anymore. Anyway, just something to, just something to resonate on. Marinate I was on. thinking, yeah, marinate, not resonate. I've just been thinking about that recently. Like the stuff you do with partners that you think you like and you think you would do alone after Camping. the relationship ends, but you really don't like it. Have you ever camped with anybody? No, but I actually, somebody that I dated in the fall called me to, you know, ruin my life this weekend because, you know, he smelled that I was over him. And I I'll tell you on. what, you sent me the wrong <laughs> screenshot because it had his phone number listed and I'm about to call him myself. I have some words for him. I hate him and he doesn't have a family. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> per usual, um, he sniffed out that I was um, enjoying my life and uh, hadn't thought about him in a really long time. And he said to sweep in and have a two-hour phone call with me. And I let him know that you can't go camping because you'll get murdered. Um, because I listen to Park Predators. So many of you tag me in that. I don't want to hype another podcast this hard, but like whatever. It just proves my point that like you'll get serial killed if you go camping. Yeah. And then he said to me, if we end up together... <laughs> He'll go camping with me. And I was like, end up together. You would call me in three months. Blocked. <laughs> Raina, that should have been your sign from the gods. This guy's like, I'll make you camp with me. Blocked. That should, you should have known in that moment. I'm sick of him coming in on your life. I'm texting him. No, actually, no, I'm FaceTiming him. I want, I want him to see this face when I tell him to leave you the fuck alone or I'm going to sue him. <laughs> For something. For... <laughs> emotional distress. <laughs> what, what, what if you like stole my phone while I was going to the bathroom and you FaceTimed him and he thought he was going to have like some sexy talk with me and your face appeared on the screen. Listen up, motherfucker. <laughs> he needs to apologize to, to me. me. <laughs> oh, man. Hot. We have a, uh, a very special guest for you guys. We are so excited to have her on the show today. She is a family physician and the chief medical officer of Planned Parenthood Hudson P- Pisonic. Is that how I said Hudson Pisonic? I almost got there. Uh, in New York, she's also a fellow with the Physicians for Reproductive Health. She graduated from UNC and received her medical degree from GW and has a double master's from Columbia. Okay, show off. And uh, she is the author of the upcoming book, You're the Only One I've Told the Stories Behind Abortion. Please welcome to the show, Mira Shaw. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. Hi, thank you for being here. So I'm obsessed with your book. (laughs) I am reading it. I haven't finished it. And just up top, I have to say, like, I'm just so floored and impressed by it. I want everyone to buy it. It's so incredible. Just like the introduction alone, which we'll get into some of those topics. And then obviously the stories. It's just so, so great. I I was, um, Raina is reading after me. We only got one advanced copy. So that's why she isn't ready yet. But I was telling her the story that you open with, of the story about being in Target. This isn't a spoiler alert, guys. It's the very beginning of the book. Um, And we like, I teared, I, well, I teared up when I read it. And then I teared up again, recounting it to Raina. And then she teared up and it's just like, it's just so beautiful. So we're we're happy to, we're we're really happy to have you here to, to talk about that. We haven't really talked about abortion in depth, and so we're really excited to have a woman and a doctor to talk about that. And you are good friends with our good friend Meryl. That's how we know you. Yes, yes. Um, she definitely connected us. Um, thank you, Meryl. Shout out to Meryl. Yeah. Um, and I'm so glad to be on your show. Um, I think this is I know this is an incredibly important topic, and um, especially with the upcoming election, um, it's really important that we talk about abortion and dispel all of the myths and um, it's commonly misunderstood and you know I, I want to talk about it and provide all the most accurate information so thanks for bringing me on the show uh, yeah of course yeah um, well I would love to hear from you and Ashley and all of our listeners um, 
a little bit more about you and just how you got into this line of work, why you picked this field. Uh, and yeah, if you could talk a little bit more about that, we would love that. Yeah. So, um, you know, I am the daughter of Indian immigrants. So I'd be lying if I said that, you know, becoming a doctor, lawyer, engineer wasn't part of my DNA. <laughs> um, Honestly, guys, I was forced into this. And that's my truth. No, yeah. I mean, it is, it, it is, you know, part of our upbringing that, you know, you must have a graduate degree, blah, blah, blah. A couple. No, but, oh, you are 17 of them. So <laughs> Ivy League hit it out of the park. <laughs> Um, but you know, I did have that example in my family. My, my father's a physician, my brother's a physician. Um, and so that's sort of where it began. But I also, ever since I was little, I've had a strong sense of social justice and it wasn't really until residency that I had a mentor who introduced, um, reproductive justice to me. And she, um, Linda Prine is her name. She's also in the book, um, made abortion so normal and she is really the one who taught all of the residents that there are so much there's so much shame and stigma around this issue but it is life-saving it is critical and it is just normal Mm -hmm. and one out of four women has an abortion in her lifetime and you know as a family physician Abortion should be presented as just a very normal option for patients to access and to have in the same way that continuing a pregnancy is immediately met with compassion and understanding and oftentimes enthusiasm, right? Um, So abortion is just the natural, normal part of somebody's reproductive lifespan. And then, you know, when I trained in abortion care and started providing abortion care, I very quickly realized that there's there's so many policies um, that limit our ability to practice abortion care. I live and I work in New York, but I've also um, provided abortion care in Indiana, in Texas, and I've seen before my eyes the difficulty in which patients have to go in order to get just basic health care. And there is no other procedure or service in healthcare that has been as politicized as abortion. And, you know, we can get into why that is and sort of the history behind that, um, because it is just really easy for politicians to use social justice issues such as gay marriage, such as, you know, gun violence, such as abortion for their own political gain. Um, It's awful. It's terrible. It's, you know, a human rights violation, but they do it anyways. And, 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 and it works for them. But uh, the end result is that it, it hurts people. And we, we can talk about that more. Good. Well, we're going to talk to you about, you know, the shame around it and how this has been politicized and, you know, just, Ashley and I talked up top, but you know, we haven't had abortions, so I don't even know how, like, I, I don't know what that looks like medically. So we would love to sort of unpack that with you just to begin with for someone who's never had one yeah, um, or might be thinking about it. I have no idea what it looks like. Yeah. yeah so I, I mean, I think it is um, good to start with the basics. I mm-hmm. get asked this question a lot. Um, so there are a couple ways to have an abortion. So the actual medical definition of an abortion is the termination of a pregnancy. So it can be an induced abortion or it can be a spontaneous abortion. So a spontaneous abortion is another word for, or is another way to say miscarriage. Um, an induced abortion can happen um, with a procedure or with medicines. So a, procedur- a procedural abortion is where the patient comes to a health center, lays on a table, and it puts their their legs in a leg rest or a foot rest. And we use a speculum, um, the same device that's used um, when an individual has a pap test. Um, So we use a speculum to visualize the cervix. So then the cervix is dilated with these metal dilators that gradually increase in size. And we dilate the cervix based on how far or how pregnant the, the individual is. After, we insert a little cannula that's like the size of a straw into the cervix and then into the uterus. And we apply like a suction on the other end to then remove the contents of the uterus. Um, In other words, to remove the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. The whole process takes less than two minutes. It's really quick. There's different levels of what we call sedation that a person can receive. A patient can have just local sedation, which is just a little bit of lidocaine or numbing medication around the cervix, or they can receive medication through 
their IV, um, fentanyl, which is a narcotic, and Versed, which is like Xanax. It's in the same family of medications. Um, and that just sort of, they're like awake, but a little groggy. You know, the medicines take the edge off. Is it really painful? So what I do tell patients is that they will feel cramping, but it's literally less than two minutes. And I tell them that it's, you know, nothing they can't handle. Um, and most of my patients do just fine. Um, More or that. less painful than an IUD. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's similar. Okay, it's, I have not had one, but I've just heard, you know, of course it's, it's manageable. Ever, you know, the, well, the women that I know that have gotten IUDs have gotten through it, but they mentioned cramping. And I was wondering if it was a similar it's, sensation. It's similar sensation because any time you stretch the cervix, that triggers the pain. It triggers cramping. Mm-hmm. Um, and like it's like when, so- when somebody goes into labor, their cervix is dilating and that's why they're feeling so much pain. So, you know, I always tell patients, like, if you saw what I was doing on my end, you would, th- you would actually probably be shocked that what I'm doing is causing so much of a uh-huh. pain sensation. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a, it's a very quick procedure, very safe. It has a less than 0.5% complication rate, okay? It is one of the safest medical procedures that we, that we do in medicine. So the other way of having an abortion is um, with medications. Um, it's called a medication abortion. It involves two pills. So the first pill is called mifepristone. Mifepristone was FDA approved in 2000, and it ends the pregnancy, um, then the second set of pills are taken at home and the patient will either insert them in the vagina or put them um, between the cheeks, let the pills dissolve. And then, you know, after th- about 30 minutes, swallow those pills. And those pills called mis- misoprostol will induce cramping and bleeding and expulsion of the pregnancy. So it's almost like causing a miscarriage at home. Huh? In a lot Is of that pe- safe? It's incredibly safe, has, you know, a similar um, safety profile as the procedural abortion. Now, a lot of people ask me, like, you know, Dr. Shaw, what's, what's better? What should I do? And I say, well, let me, let's talk about what's important to you. Is it important to you to be able to do this in the privacy of your own home? Or is it important to you to just come in pregnant and leave not pregnant from an office, right? Mm-hmm. Both ways are effective, safe. It's really about what the the patient wants their abortion experience to look like. Okay, yeah. and then time frame, first trimester. So that's a great question. Right. Like, does the does so, the, the method matter with how pregnant you are? I guess. Yeah. So we so medication abortion um, can be done up to eleven weeks um, of pregnancy, and then. It, in New York State, the legal limit is 24 weeks for an abortion. And after that, thanks to the Reproductive Health Act, which passed last year, patients are allowed to have abortions past 24 weeks if the fetus has something that is not compatible with life or if the pregnancy is threatening the life mm-hmm. and the health of the parent. Okay. So let's talk about first trimester second trimester, a later abortion, and discuss some of the facts surrounding that. Because I think some people might hear that you can get an abortion at 24 weeks in some states and they're doing the math and that might sound a little crazy to them. I, I, for one, I'm one of those people that have done some research on it and we want you to speak on, on it. So the vast majority of abortions in this country occur in the first trimester, and the vast majority of the abortions that occur in the first trimester um, occur um, less than eight weeks in pregnancy. So it's a smaller percentage of patients who are seeking abortion um, later in pregnancy. Um, And as I said earlier, the situations in which um, patients are seeking later abortion are unique and parents are choosing to have an abortion for reasons that are very personal um, and usually related to um, the health of the fetus that they're carrying. Okay. So if you like were to qualify it with like a percentage, like how many people are doing it first trimester? Over 99% of abortions occur um, in the first trimester. So, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for me to see patients who are so early that, you know, the pregnancy test is barely even positive. Mm-hmm. Um, people know their bodies. And, and, you know, as soon as they miss a period, they, they, they tend to act pretty quickly. Okay. okay. 
Yep, we just wanted to clear that up because I, I, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but clearly I think there's been some things from some of our political leaders and whatnot that twist that narrative of a later abortion and just spew things that aren't accurate. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, thanks. That's, I think it's important to talk about that and to clear up all the myths. And then obviously this looks different in every state in terms of a, where you can even go the waiting periods, making you listen to an ultrasound, all these things that are basically designed to try to deter you not to do it. And I mean, can we talk about that a little bit? Definitely. And I, it, that's actually, you know, that's, it, it's a really big discussion and it's an important one because unfortunately the zip code in which you live really dictates the type of care that you receive <laughs> okay. and what your abortion looks like. Does it also dictate in terms of a doctor, like what you have to say to a patient? Like, do you have to say to a patient the thing you just talked about? Like, do you have to talk to them about, do you really want to do this? Stuff like that. Are you like legally bound to do something like this? So again, that also depends on where you live. So counseling is a really important part of any medical procedure, right? Like in medicine, we always go over the risks, benefits, and the alternatives of any procedure. That's just like the standard of care. And then we tailor our counseling to the individual patient's needs because no two patients are alike, right? No two lives are alike. Um, However, in many states, there are mandated, required, like, scripts that the physician has to read to the patient. In Texas, um, when I was there and providing abortion care, I had to tell the patient that um, abortion causes breast cancer. (sighs) Now, that's not true. But that's crazy. Just straight up misinformation. That's a law. That's a law that you have to say that to somebody. Yes. Yep. That's not true. That's not true. (laughs) Um, Who makes that a law? <laughs> it's it's. And then what room of people just raised their hand and was like, yep, let's all tell women this causes breast cancer? I yeah. can't. That's crazy. Okay, it's fine. I'm going to reserve my judgment. Yeah. Okay. The, the first no, chapter of the book her. is she's in Texas. Uh-huh. I read that this morning. And yeah. like one of the sentences that stuck out to me the most was that she had to wait, what, 24 hours? And I think you wrote as if she hadn't been agonizing over this for weeks. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, can't you get a gun quicker than that? That, yeah. that was in the book. <laughs> yeah. That was literally, hour waiting no, period. like that was literally, and the irony is that next door, you can go buy a gun without any consultation or waiting period. I love that you, that you said that also. I mean, obviously you wrote in the book, but um, that, you know, people, people don't just walk into an abortion clinic willy nilly. Like this is a fun thing to do today. You've, you've agonized over this for a long time. Well, and so, you know, some people, yes, for some people it's a hard decision. And for some, it's not like it's, yeah. it's not, and it's not really a choice. It's like the only option that they have. Sure. I right? mean, the 24 hour waiting period thing is silly. Of course you've thought about it. You didn't just wake up and walk into a clinic. Well, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, I think that people who have abortions have this this reputation of being um, irresponsible when it's in fact the exact opposite. Yeah. It's, you know, I wish that we could flip the narrative and say, no, people who seek abortion care are taking parenting very, very seriously. Right. Right. So it's like they are saying, well, you know, right now it's not a good time. Right now, like I can't bring a child into this world and and you know help them thrive. Like, you know, and I saw this a lot actually during COVID. Like when COVID hit um, New York in March, like very early on, um, very hard. I had patients coming to um, to the health center to receive an abortion, saying to me, you know, like this was actually a desired pregnancy. And I lost my job and I'm facing a lot of financial insecurity and it's just not the time anymore. Mm -hmm. And that individual was taking her life and her family's life very seriously. She wasn't being, you know, irresponsible and willy nilly about it to use, you know, your, your language. Um, She was, she was being a a mature adult and making a, a decision that, that was right for her and her family. And, and that's what we need to get behind and that's what we need to be supportive of. Absolutely. I think we derailed you a little bit like in terms of what it looks like. I mean, we, you know, again, it's different in every state. Do you want to share like a spectrum of the quote unquote easiest to the quote unquote hardest? Yeah. And definitely. we can come back to that. Yeah. Because yeah, I like yeah, what you're yeah. saying. We'll come back to that. No, and, definitely. You know, definitely. Um, yeah. So... So, you know, I practice in New York where there are no waiting periods. There's actually never been a waiting period. An individual can, you know, find out that they're pregnant um, and then, you know, call a health center and get in the same day. 
Um, and now with telehealth, it's made it that much easier. You can literally have a medication abortion counseling, like the like the the visit office visit part over you know your laptop or your phone, your smartphone, and then the FDA actually requires that health centers dispense the medications, which is also not medically necessary, but that is the federal law. So we do have to follow it. So the individual still has to get to the health center to pick them up. We can't like send a prescription for the pills to like the local pharmacy. Mm -hmm. Um, So that is a barrier to care. And, you know, we follow all those rules, but that's still a part of it. So that that's New York. Now, let's go to like Texas and Indiana, which are the states that I've worked in. And in Texas, and I highlight a lot of this in the book as well, but in Texas, an individual has to go to the health center, get an ultrasound, which is mandatory. Um, and we know with a lot of research um, that if an individual is sure of their last menstrual period and you know you can calculate how far in their pregnancy they are, and that's also a very medically sound way to determine how far, far along they are. But instead, in many states, a really invasive transvaginal ultrasound is required. Um, you know, I don't know if y'all have had one. I've had one. It's not comfortable. Which the purpose is to just be like, there's a baby in there. Do you really want to do this? Right. right? Am I right? Yes. And Well, it's to say, yes. It's to say, they say it's to confirm how far along the pregnancy is. But really, it's to show the image in many states, to show the image to the patient to turn up the the Doppler, meaning the the heart sound, so the heart tone, I, so you can oh hear it, um, to describe what's on the screen. Um, so like it's not hard enough. Like it's yeah. just it's it's unnecessary. So legally, you have to do this. You have to play the heart sound. You have to do the ultrasound. It depends. So it depends it. on the state. Okay. So it depends on the state. Yes. Like there there are various requirements around the ultrasound okay. um, that that these things have to be done. Yes. Okay. And then the individual has to go home. So in Texas, has to go home for 24 hours. In Indiana, they have to go home for 18 hours. Um, in Missouri, it's 72 hours. Um, so in every in, in many states, it's different, and they're it's all arbitrary. Mar- Missouri, what? There's one clinic, right? Yes, there's one health center. Yeah, and so it's all under the guise of like, well, this is supposed to protect women, but really, it's actually really harmful because. You know, that's more time off of work. They have to get to the health center and back. They have to like sometimes find a ride, right? Find or you figure out child care. It's really logistically challenging. And Absolutely. one thing in the book that I never thought of, if you don't have a ride, you can't be sedated, right? So there's that so, too. So like if you don't, if you're telling nobody and you're, you're, you're ashamed and nobody, nobody will pick you up, you can't get pain management. Right. You can't. Which is really hard. And I, you know, that's something I see actually in, in New York as well. And oftentimes it's because patients don't want to tell anyone because there's so much shame and there's so much stigma. And they do have somebody who would pick them up, right? Like they from, from like them. the dentist. But <laughs> they, right. they, from they, LASIK, but <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a very private have, thing. It's not, the, I'm not going to advertise it on social media. You know, it's very, very private. So, right. Of course. But like not even being able to tell like a loved one because you're so ashamed mm-hmm. is like, you know, that yeah. really hurts me. And that the fact Absolutely. that like they can't have the abortion experience that they want Mm -hmm. that's really hard yeah but you know we talked about the scripts and having to say things like abortion causes breast cancer but also in um in indiana you know i have to show an image of um a fetus in the various stages of development and say like this is the size of the pregnancy that you are aborting um which again is unnecessary and it's really hurtful and harmful Mm -hmm. and and just like exacerbates the shame um and then in many states, Texas and Indiana included, patients can't use their insurance. Not only can they use their pu- not use their public insurance, but they can't use their private insurance, their commercial insurance. So patients are having to pay out of pocket for the procedure plus or minus sedation or the medication abortion, which is just terrible because abortion is healthcare and right. Yeah, it's usually what upwards of five hundred dollars if people are curious, right? Which yeah. is a lot of money for a so, lot of people. There, so in some studies show they, that the average cost of like the medication abortion is around five hundred, six hundred dollars. And then you know, if you have a if to ha- do you have to have a pre- procedure or you're choosing to have a procedure, it can be more expensive. And then you add the cost of the the sedation, mm-hmm. and then some 
abortions can only happen in a health center up to a certain number of weeks. Otherwise, they have to happen in in a hospital. And hospital-based care is always more expensive, mm-hmm. right? And you have to pay out of pay out of pocket, like. I mean, you're talking a fortune for a lot of people, exactly. especially people that are not in a position to have children. You're obviously making financial decisions already. Right. Well, and before we really get into why women have abortions, again, obviously a multitude of reasons we're going to cover them. Like, I, I just, I want to say, I love this part in the book. I'm just going to quote it. I highlighted it a lot um, <laughs> where you said, we can simultaneously believe that there is potential life growing in a uterus and trust the person carrying the pregnancy to do what is right for them in their own lives, which I'm pro-choice, Raina, we're all pro-choice in this room. Um, you know, it's it's weird. It's weird to say pro-abortion. It's just pro-women doing what they feel is best for their own bodies and their own lives. There are people for various reasons, religious reasons, that believe that it's completely wrong and immoral to terminate a potential life. And I think that is fine for them to believe that. And I, I like that you wrote that in the book of... If that's your belief system, that's your belief system. If you would never get an abortion because this is what you believe, then you don't get an abortion because it's what you believe, you know? And I want to respect people that hold those beliefs. What I don't respect is other people forcing those beliefs on other people and and shaming them and protesting outside the the clinics and everything like that. I mean, that's how I, I feel. I don't feel the need to argue with people about when life begins, but... What I will argue and defend until the day I die are women's rights to make these decisions regarding their own bodies and how wrong it is that politicians, primarily male, get to make these decisions and make these laws regarding women's reproductive health. Definitely. And and I'm really glad you brought that up. The other day, somebody said to me, like, Mira, how do you deal with the people who believe that this ball of cells, you know, is a living being, I said, you know what? I respect that. I respect that because you know what? Like that person has a lived experience that I don't know about. That person, you know, has been maybe going to church or maybe going to the temple, maybe has had all this messaging from family members, from grandparents, maybe that, you know, like, I don't know where that's coming from, but it's coming from somewhere. And I respect and I honor that. I mean, I think that every individual has their own unique set of beliefs, whether it stems from religion, whether it stems from philosophy, whatever it is. And we just have to recognize that it's the it's the intersection of public policy (laughs) um, and personal individual beliefs that really that I have a problem with, because as a as a physician, as a healthcare provider, I want to do what's best for my patient. And I trust that they know what they're doing with their lives and that like, and I'm here just to facilitate it. I'm not here to ask them, why are you here having an abortion? I don't need to know why. If they want, you know, to run it by me, if they want to tell me about what they're feeling, if they want to tell me their story, you know what? I'm here for it. But I'm not here to justify anybody's lived experience. I'm here to just honor it. I mean, I have patients who have told me, like, I don't believe in abortion, but I need one, right? And well, guess what you do? And and, and <laughs> you believe in abortion? Now? <laughs> I'm and 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 I'm like, you know what? I'm I, I'm here to take care of you. You mm-hmm. know, like I am here to support you. And and it's hard. It's really hard again when like the people making these policies are the ones who will never have trouble mm-hmm. accessing healthcare, mm-hmm. and yet what they're doing is preventing. <laughs> people who are low income, people who are black and brown, people who are of the LGBTQIA community from accessing base, basic needs. And that that's where I have a problem when when with religion and beliefs um, interfere with policy. Absolutely. So let's talk about the patients that you're seeing, who comes in to have abortions, what type of people are making these decisions. Um, is it 15 year old girls? Is it people that are already mothers? Who, who are you seeing? What does this look like? <laughs> Great question. I also get this question a lot. Um, and so it's an important one because I think that there's a lot of misconception around who's getting abortions. I know that there's a lot of misconception and I see patients of every background demographic. Um, every age, um, racial, religious, ethnic makeup. I mean, everyone, 
I see is totally different, totally unique. You know, I can't say that there is the typical abortion patient. I, I see young people. I see people who thought they were going through menopause and maybe they were, but then they ovulated, got pregnant, you know. Mm. Um, Interesting. I, I did an abortion on like a 55 year old the other day. Yeah, I mean, I thought an interesting stat in the book, um, I don't know the percentage of women that get abortions that have children already. I think people don't think about that. I think they picture a young girl or, you know, some irresponsible 20 something or, you know, and I I think that I think even the age was what the most the highest percentage of women are 25 plus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, that's something that a lot of people don't know is that the majority of patients receiving abortions are already parents and they already have children. Um, and so it kind of goes to my point that people who have abortions are taking parenting very seriously, right? right? Yeah. Because they know what it means. Yeah. And, and I take it seriously. I had this, um, I, I would never venture to say I had a pregnancy scare. I've never had an actual pregnancy scare, but um, I was dating somebody um, pretty seriously and my period had just taken a little longer than it usually did. And so it started making me think, you know, well, this is a person I'm committed to. We do have means. We care about each other, but you know, we live in different states. I'm not super in love with him. I don't see myself ending up with this person. I didn't want to have kids with him. So like I'm in I'm five weeks into not getting my period or something. And I'm like, is it irresponsible if I would terminate a pregnancy? You know, can I give somebody the life that I had growing up? So those are the kind of things I think running through my head as a 30 year old, considering like, could I get an abortion? What would that look like? And that's that's totally valid. And the, the the thoughts that you were thinking are exactly what many of my patients are thinking and, you know, sharing with me in the exam room. It's very normal and very common. And something that we don't talk about as much is like, what about the person who just doesn't ever want kids? Me. You know, we ta- <laughs> see, there you go. Yeah, I don't want children. Yeah. We'll talk, we'll do an episode on it later, guys, if you're curious. I mean, yeah. people know, our listeners know this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have, you know, I have a very, very close friend who, and she and her husband, you know, I, I, they're very, we're very close and they, we're, we're the same age in our mid thirties and her husband got a vasectomy and they're like, we just don't see children in our lives. And, I, you know, they, but they have felt, they have had to justify that to people, you know, the grandparents, the, the the wannabe grandparents, right? So their parents who were just like wanting to be grandparents. And it's just not the quote unquote norm in our society, yet that's not fair. Like if an individual doesn't see having children as part of like their lived experience, then that's okay. We need to be supportive of that too, right? you know? Because you're taking parenting seriously. Like I love that you say it like that, you Mm -hmm. know? If I'm really serious about not having kids, I'm taking it seriously. Right. And I was really serious and I am, you know, if I had kids that I want them to have the life that I had. And if I can't give that to them or if I think that they're going to be raised in a household with two people that don't love each other, that don't live in the same house and that's what I want to give somebody then it's okay to say that too. And I was a 30-year-old person of means. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, let's talk about the power in sharing stories, normalizing abortion, the shame, the stigmas, all the things. Yeah. So I, I guess I can talk about my own experience. Mm-hmm. So I've never been pregnant. I grew up in a very conservative family in South Carolina. My parents are Indian immigrants. Um, and we didn't talk about sex. We didn't you know, talk about any of that um, stuff. I never saw, my parents love each other very much, but, you know, they never kissed one another. It's just, you know, that's just cultural. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I I became a physician. I, you know, specialize in sexual reproductive health care. And I'm a very loud and proud abortion provider. But that wasn't always the case. I was shy about it. I didn't talk about it very much because I didn't feel comfortable saying that I was an abortion provider because I was scared of what like response I would get, Um, whether it be from like family friends or friends who, you know, I wasn't sure where they stood because we weren't even really talking about it. I knew my friends were progressive, but I didn't really know where they landed on abortion. Right. Mm -hmm. I also was concerned for safety. Um, Yeah. That was interesting to read in the book that some women, they're scared for their lives to to be doing these procedures. Yeah. Which is interesting because it would be so comforting for me to like walk into an office and see a young woman Woman who I like feel like I can relate to that I could talk to. So how important it is to have somebody your age providing something like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You said you put music on, you yeah. talk about Beyonce. Oh yeah. You like like treat them like humans that they are. Totally. I, I would feel I, much I, more comfortable. Yeah. So we I, like, need, listen to we Rihanna. Need more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or jazz if you want, you know. Whatever you want. I, whatever, whatever you want. Taylor's new Taylor Swift. Yeah. Totally. Which is a great album, by the <laughs> way. Yeah. Oh, duh. <laughs> the best album. Um, 
Yeah. And then, you know, I, it was actually this, the experience um, in Target, which I talk about in my book, where I had an encounter with a complete stranger who told me she had an abortion. And that was after I got the courage to tell her that I was a doctor who provided abortion care. And, you know, I, I shared my truth. She shared her truth. And I felt like we had a moment. And I just started to tell people after that, that like I provide abortion care. Yeah, period. And that's what I do. And it's the work that I love and I'm really proud of it. And I just started to get like so many stories from, I mean, I was from just complete strangers Uh at barbecues. Um, I, I was a jury duty and this like older Jewish man told me that he and his wife had an abortion after getting, you know, getting some advice from their rabbi. And I, I just started to get all these stories. And so some of those stories that I got, you know, I've shared in the the book. Um, and then, you know, some of the other stories in the book kind of found me in other ways. Mm-hmm. And I, what, what I all also found was that when an individual shared their story with me afterwards, many people would say, wow, like you're the only one I've told, or I haven't told many people this. And it felt really nice to share that. Um, yeah. And I said, and I just said, gosh, we should just be talking about this so much. And so I hope that by me sharing what I do opens people up and makes it easier for them to share with one another. Or keep it personal, because like I said, you don't have in the to, book, yeah, you share. don't have to yeah. share your story if you don't want to. That's totally fine. But I hope that we can get to a place where if an individual wants to share their story, that they can. Yeah, I guess it's just, I don't know, it's one of those weird things. It's like, why is it so like taboo? That's not really the right word, but like why are people so scared to share is, are they worried about how it's going to make them look like it's going to reflect poorly on their character? Like, I'm just trying to think of, of why, you know, and clearly there's the fear that you will have somebody in the room that's super anti-abortion and pro-life, and then it'll just turn into a really heated debate. But then I guess the fear is that you'll be judged and, and looked at differently, I guess, you know, and obviously people hear your, a doctor that provides abortion care and they immediately know, okay, one, same team, Mm -hmm. you know, I know where she stands (laughs) and B, this person isn't going to judge me. So I I don't know. I mean, it's, we talked, it's very different, but we talked about this on our, our sexual assault episode too, just like the, the shame and the stigma around some of these things and why people are scared to share them with others and like keep these quote unquote secrets or things about them just completely to themselves. Yeah. To themselves. Even if you feel like your friends would be accepting. And before we started recording, I was saying to Ashley, you know, I have friends that I've had lifelong friends that told me years later that they had abortions. And I'm the last person to judge that. I think you should do exactly what you want with your body and your life. Um, but I was, I'm surprised when somebody that I've known and been close with for years will tell me that they've done that because I'm the last person to judge it, but it is, it's not talked about that much. And it's, it's interesting to me because it's, it's not this horrible, shameful thing. And again, I agree. If you don't want to share it, don't share it. That's yeah, a yeah. very personal thing. But um, wasn't, yeah. Wasn't there a Sex and City episode? They all just like talked about their abortions. They all just, they hadn't talked about it since they'd been mm-hmm. friends. And then Carrie went and found that guy. The waiter. The waiter. And he didn't remember her. Told, did she tell yeah. him? No, she, she just says, she goes, hi. Yeah, and he doesn't recognize her. <laughs> but they all just had this moment of like, wait, I've had an abortion. I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know. Also, everybody's different in what they choose to share with the world and I think we all know that word can travel fast. And especially when you're younger, people tend to be more gossipy. And so I'm sure some people just don't share these personal things about themselves because they don't want the world to know. I I don't know. I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been reflecting a lot. If I had an abortion, who would I I tell? Like, would I be like my mom and my mom and Raina? Or would it uh be more of like, this is a thing I'm talking about in mixed company because I want to normalize it more? I think maybe, and you're the expert, you tell me, but if I were to hypothesize, maybe people have this like deep-seated desire to like explain away why they did it and have you understand why they did it and not feel like they're a quote unquote bad person for doing it. And some people don't want to have those conversations, even though all of your reasons are probably number one, really thought about for a long time, very difficult, very rational, but maybe you just feel this like need to really explain yourself. And those are really tough conversations. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that's exactly mm-hmm. what it is, Rena. And I think that like the, you know, it's like, well, I had an abortion, but let me give you the like eight reasons why mm-hmm. it's okay. 
you know, and that's not fair. You should just be able to say, I had an abortion, period. Why Why do we need to, to break it down for the person that we're sharing it with, right? Right. But you're right. That is, I think, the immediate gut reaction. Like, I just need to justify this immediately. Well, when people tell me they're pregnant, I mean, there's memes about it of like how it changes over the years. Like when your friend tells you she's pregnant when you're in college, it's like, oh, are, what, are, what are we doing about this? But then in, in your 30s, you're supposed to be like, or late 20s, 30s, you're excited. I still feel like I'm a little flatlined on people telling me they're pregnant because, right, why? It's like, did you, is this what you want? Then uh, congratulations. Ashley's like, they need to justify it to me. <laughs> no, it's just kind of like, you, you're right. Like, is it, uh, sometimes you just don't know how to react. You you need to kind of pick up the tone from the person telling you. So I had a friend the other day just send me an ultrasound and I was like, are we excited or? So <laughs> I, I love that you just said that, Ashley, because, you know, in training, my mentor always taught us when delivering the results of a pregnancy test, you wait for their reaction. Because it's so common for people to immediately say, oh, congratulations. And that's just, that's yes. not always, that's not yeah. always what the person wanted, uh -huh. right? You don't know what they want. So wait for, wait for their body language, wait for them to respond, right? So as a physician and as a friend to so many, I have been on the receiving end of so many pictures of ultrasounds, of, you know, positive pregnancy tests. And I, my, my text back is always, so how do you feel about this? Right? Like, how do you feel? I don't uh -huh. know. I don't know how you feel. I'm not going to assume I know how you feel. Right. right? Like, yeah. And, and so, I mean, yeah. So, so thank you for, <laughs> I just think of, I think of knocked up the movie where oh, yeah. she just like cries. Um, in the room. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering another, this is kind of heavy, but, um, I know I have a friend that had an abortion that has no children, but wants children with her partner whom she had an abortion with. And I know that's such a tough decision because they want children at some point, but it's not the right time. And I, I know how hard it was just from talking to her about it. And I sympathize with anyone who was having to face a decision like that, because it's not that you just don't want children. You want children and you are terminating a pregnancy with even the partner that you want to have children with. And I, I assume that's probably why people may not share that information because of the judgment they think they may receive. And then they have the fear that like, what if I struggle to get pregnant again, like with this partner and I terminated a pregnancy. I'm saying this with, with clearly no judgment and again, the utmost sympathy and respect for any decision a woman decides to make regarding her own body and also, of course, not being able to relate myself. Totally. I've heard that scenario a lot too in my professional and personal life. Um, I don't really have a medical response for that, mm -hmm. but I think as like a human being and as a friend and loved one to so many, I think that it is a really hard um, thing for many folks to wrap their heads around because they're like, I am you know, getting older and like, I do want to be pregnant and I do want to parent, but you know, my biological clock is ticking. And so kind of one of my other campaigns is to normalize egg freezing. That's what we <laughs> and, had Meryl on to talk about. And, and ah, yeah, she came on. That's why we had her on. Oh yeah. She talked about it. So I've frozen my eggs too. And yeah. I tell everyone that I'm like, you know, cause I want to be a parent one day, you know, but right now it's just not the time. Yeah. And no, just to flex. I like went and had like a, <laughs> <laughs> I had a consultation about freezing my eggs and they were like, you are so fertile. I had so many follicles. But that place closed. <laughs> they did. <laughs> they went out of business. Sorry, I just had to make <laughs> okay, but they were really hyping up like my reproductive abilities. I had like 19 follicles or something. It's not a lot. They were like, wow, you're very fertile. You're very fertile. Um, I, I think another thing, by the way, that you were talking about, like friends with kids. Um, I had this discussion with my mom once. My mom had a lot of difficulty getting pregnant. My mom had multiple um, miscarriages. They went, her and my father went through all kinds of hormones and shots. And my mom like wanted a baby so badly. Like I was such a miracle to her. Um and I, I remember talking to her once and saying, like, how would you feel if I ever needed an abortion? And, you know, I think that can sometimes be a barrier to discussing things with other people as well and feeling like the people around you wanted kids so badly yeah. and you don't want this. And my mom's response was, you know, I 
I want you to do what you, what's good for you and your body. I was married to your father. I was in a place financially to have kids, you know, whatever. So, um, but I do think that there is some shame around that, especially at a certain age when all of your friends want kids or they've struggled to have kids mm-hmm. and you don't want to be looked at as it's so cavalier that you just like waltzed in and got an abortion, you know? Yeah. I think that happens a lot. Why, why we're spending like half the episode just speculating why people <laughs> are scared to share. But I mean, I, I just want to also just validate why people would be yeah. ashamed. I don't want anyone to I think to it's feel an important discussion. Yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah. So um, we, we obviously sympathize with anybody that's feeling, that's struggling with sharing their truth. Yeah. If that's what they want to do. I mean, it's the same as like, and I hear, and I hear this too. It's like, the, you know, the friend who's having a hard time getting pregnant and then like the other friend who gets pregnant after, right. you yeah. know, like a month of trying, uh-huh. right? Like it's, yeah. it's, yeah, fertility also issues. Sex the episode. Yeah. <laughs> an episode yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe you have some good advice then. Like if you're not comfortable talking to a friend, if you feel a lot of shame, are there like good online forums that you would like love to recommend? Yes. That can, like, oh, that's um, such a great into? question. A hotline. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> no, thank you so much much for asking thank that, you for validating me i really yes, appreciate it um, <laughs> no that's a really hot, hot important question, question. <laughs> so there's an organization called all options um and they provide counseling around any fertility pregnancy reproductive health issue so whether you want to continue your pregnancy whether you you know you're struggling getting pregnant whether you want to have an abortion whether it you're struggling with the decision around having an abortion. They're really awesome. There's also another organization called Exhale um, and they provide a lot of counseling around abortion. So those, those are the two that I would, that I would, you know, put in a plug for. Great. I imagine you're like 16 years old. I don't know. We have a lot of 16 year old listeners, but like, I don't know who I would have talked to about it at that age. My other dumb 16 year old friends. I don't know. That is, Um, I will say the most common place for, for young people to access information around sexual reproductive health care is their friends as well as the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I mean, I work for Planned Parenthood, so I will put in a plug for Planned Parenthood that we have a lot of great resources on our website. Bedsider.org is another organization that produces a lot of really good content around sexual and reproductive health care that's really accessible to young people. Their graphics are awesome, and they have really cool videos and a lot of, like, good information um, with regards to anything related to sex. Um, we'll, and we'll list all these all on Instagram stories for you guys. Um, this is probably a dumb question that I should know, but if you are 16 or you're 15 or you're under your minor, um, that's the word, uh, if, and you come in and need an abortion, how does that look? Excellent question. It, that again, depends on where you live. Okay. So if you are in New York and you want to access anything related to sexual and reproductive health, whether it be um, accessing contraception, whether it be um, getting an abortion, um, getting PrEP or PEP for HIV prevention, um, getting emergency contraception, um, the list goes on. You don't have to get consent from a parent or a guardian. Okay. Um, you can come in if you can get there <laughs> and, and, and receive that care. You can consent to it. Um, at Planned Parenthood or at any? If you're receiving care from anyone okay, okay. in New York State. Great, got it. Yeah. Okay. Now, in many states, there are rules around how and if um, minors are able to access abortion care. So in many states, if you are pregnant and deciding to continue the pregnancy, you are considered an, an emancipated minor. Um, now, if you are wanting an abortion, you have to have parental consent or you have to seek what they call um, judicial bypass, meaning you have to go to court on your own and have a judge grant you the right to access abortion care. I write about this in my in my book. The chapter is called Vidalia, and it's about um, an individual who seeks judicial bypass because she did not and could not tell her mother that she needed an abortion, and she was in West Virginia and needed care. Okay. And so she went around that law and had a judge say it was okay for her to get an abortion. This might, might be a, also a very stupid question. If you have like a, a West Virginia driver's license, can you go to Pennsylvania and get, can, can you go to another state with another state's? Yes. Okay. Yep. And so this is one of the reasons why people travel to get abortion care. Okay. Um, because of state restrictions, they'll go to like other states, like a neighboring state if it's more liberal and more um, progressive. Okay. Yeah. 
Great um, question. Danielle. Well, I love Planned Parenthood and it was special for me growing up because I was sexually active at like 16, 17. I didn't grow up in a non-sex positive household, but I don't know that I would have asked my mom to take me to get birth control. So like Planned Parenthood was a safe, clean, healthy place. I could do that judgment free when I was in high school. So it meant a lot to me to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I went to Planned Parenthood but my first year I moved to New York. I needed a, a, a gyno appointment and I was just like, I'm just going to roll up to Planned Parenthood. And then I met Dr. Sean. And then, <laughs> but now he doesn't do it anymore. Anyway. Um, okay. We want to talk a lot about some of the political stuff, some racial issues, barriers to access, all this, all these kind of things. Most of us are pretty familiar with politics enough to understand that abortion has become such a partisan issue and not become, it always has been. And kind of how crazy that is, honestly, uh, and how hypocritical it is. Like we said, you know, the people that are quote unquote anti-abortion pro-life would probably get an abortion if they needed to, and, you know, just speculating there, but it will always be accessible to them. And there's just, there's a lot of hypocrisy, obviously. And of course, just in general, creating more barriers to access birth control, but also being anti-abortion, like this just doesn't align there. Uh, but yeah, we want to talk about some of this stuff. You know, at the core of it all, it's a healthcare issue. Um, it has been made political by politicians, mostly white men, white cis men, to get votes. It's been exploited, um, and it's so unfortunate. And I think politicians are really good at using social justice issues um, at their disposal, right? And, and, I, and I think I said earlier, so it's, you know, gay marriage was one that was used. And a lot of people are single issue voters and say, okay, well, he's anti-gay marriage. I'm going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. Right. Totally. But now, you know, when gay marriage became legal and I think 2015, it's, we, we don't hear about it as much. Right. Um, so honestly, that would be my wish is that there would be, so Roe v. Wade, just to clarify, actually it made it so that abortion was not a crime in all 50 states. If it were to be overturned, many states have what we call trigger laws in place to make it illegal in those individual places. Um, so what would be really great is to, there's a bill called the Women's Health Protection Act um, that was introduced in the Senate in 2019 that would provide federal protections around abortion and to codify it as a healthcare issue. So that's a piece of legislation that we can all get behind. There's also um, the Hyde Amendment, which is terrible. And um, it, it's, it's an amendment that gets voted on like every year. And it has been since it was implemented a few years after Roe v. Wade that prevents um, public funds from being used to towards abortion. And so if we got rid of that um, in the Each Woman Act, which is another piece of legislation that we can also get behind the Each Woman Act. The little component about the Hyde Amendment. So many states, so Medicaid um, is funded, is partially state funded, partially federally, federally funded. So 17 states have said, well, my, our state dollars are being, are contributing to this. So therefore we're going to allow, so like New York, for example, says, well, state funds are contributing to Medicaid. And so we're going to allow Medicaid to be used to pay for abortion. So that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And 17 of the 50 states allow this. So the rest don't, which is the vast majority. Which are the people who are like, I don't want my tax dollars going to abortion. Exactly. Like, okay, your tax dollars go to a lot of stuff that you don't even know about or <laughs> totally. use. Or, come on, people. Totally. But but politicians and the media are making this issue right. worse. Yeah. And saying, you know, like... And, and a lot of people, like I said, are single issue voters and it's become this way in the recent past and not like it used to not be this way from like some of my older colleagues say, uh -huh. like it just wasn't really like this. But I think it's common. It's very, very common. I mm -hmm. think people, especially that are not super um, well informed about politics because it can be really uh, scary to talk about and uh, intimidating. I would encourage people to not be single issue voters and just sort of look at the whole picture Big because picture. I think oftentimes... 
you know, maybe a candidate that's running on that one policy, everything else they stand for is actually at your detriment, um, especially as a woman, for your other rights, for how much you make, for the other rights that you have in the state. Um, I just think oftentimes, and some people that are in power today, you know, they run on these one issue and you vote for them, but all of their other policies really affect you negatively. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that politics can be really intimidating. You don't know where to look, but just try. <laughs> just get well, on the yeah. internet and try. Well, also just realize they yeah. don't, it's not real. They don't care. They don't care about these fetuses. They don't. Yeah. They're the ones that don't care that there were and still are kids in cages at the border. Like they're not the ones that are really caring about our nation's youth when they are out of the womb. Mm-hmm. So it's like just try to see through the bullshit. Honestly, like not, nothing else they stand for actually aligns with caring so much about. <laughs> you know, a heartbeat in the womb and, right. you know, I, well, I where do they go. stand on education after you have the kid? Right. Like, that's what, about that's their like, education it's like all they care about a, 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 right. quote unquote is, you know, the fetus. I mean, well, I could go on and on about this. And they're also like the, the same ones who would be able to access an abortion. Of course. If I'd like to they see needed the, one the and diagram <laughs> of the anti-abortion politicians who have funded abortions. Would love to see it. Would love the receipts on that. Yeah. <laughs> And also, not a hot take, but people are going to get abortions regardless. Mm-hmm. Yep. Regardless of whether you make them a, a criminal act or outlaw them, people will get them and they will be less safe than if they would have had access. And it's just like, I think that's one of the main arguments of how futile these efforts are. And like, we should just obviously focus on a million other things that would Im- Im- improve the, the country, honestly, and like our whole our whole system, even the healthcare system. There's so many other things within the healthcare system that need improving on. Um, but I, I do want to talk just about how barriers to access and political intervention really affect Black and Brown people and low income people, people in rural areas, LGBTQIA folks. So. Um, can you just provide us a little of your information expertise on on this? So people, a lot of people just aren't are, aren't aware, and a lot of people live in a bubble of like, I can get an abortion if I want. And it's like, yeah, it's not so easy for everyone else. Yeah, it's not. And I think so. We can start with the LGBTQIA um, community. Um, it's one that I work with a lot at, at Planned Parenthood. I also provide um, hormone therapy for my trans and gender non-binary patients for their to facilitate their gender transition. And you know, the community has. Not only do they face a lot of stigma and shame and violence in their daily lives, um, but many of them face those same disparities in in the exam room or when they're seeing a doctor, if they see a doctor at all, Mm -hmm. right? Many, many of my trans patients, you know, don't feel safe going to the doctor. They feel like they have to teach their doctor how to take care of them. They have to teach their doctor about their body. I I used to work at Cal and Lord, which is an amazing organization, um, healthcare organization in downtown Manhattan. Um, and I, I I had a lot of patients who had specifically moved to the city just to receive care because there was no one in like South Carolina or few to you know just like one or two providers in South Carolina who really felt comfortable. Um, caring for the needs of the community. And I think, so, you know, I've had patients who identify as trans and who have a uterus and are using testosterone for masculinization and who stop getting their periods because testosterone will do that. Um, But that doesn't mean that they're not ovulating and could get pregnant if they have sex in a procreative way. Mm -hmm. But they don't oftentimes get that education or know that that is even a possibility. Um, many people assume that they never want to have children and that's also not true that, you know, many trans people want a parent, um, and we need to be supportive of that, you know, in terms of black and brown people, they faced disparities in healthcare for, you know, for so long. And that honestly could be an episode in itself. Um, and you know, I am brown myself, um, but I will, you know, my black, colleagues and my black patients can say and will say that there's a lot of racism in healthcare and a lot of that, you know, people say, oh, I'm not racist, but there's what we're not, we're not talking about the overt racism. Right. You're as not much refusing anymore. to see a black patient. Exactly. It's when in the room. Right. It's, it's more about the implicit bias that goes on. And one of the things that, you know, uh, in my position and as an educator and as an activist and an advocate is to, 
is, is to I'm, what I'm working towards is training more um, doctors of color to provide abortion care, more advanced practice clinicians, so PAs and NPs um, and midwives who are of color to provide abortion care and to lift the voices of those healthcare providers who are of color to become activists. Because there's a lot of research that shows that people of color do prefer their healthcare provider to be of color Mm -hmm. and that there's less bias that goes on when minorities are treated by minorities. Um, And so we need to acknowledge that and recognize that and do an act on that. So that's something that I, that I am working on. And then people who are of low income are going to turn to Medicaid in order to get healthcare services. And the vast majority of people seeking um, abortion care are of color and with Medicaid and they can't use their health insurance to get health care. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's a story that I, in, in my book about a, young, um, a woman named Desiree who is living in Indiana and can't access abortion care and she is of color and she talks about her lived experience and, and being a black woman and just not being able to get basic health care. Uh-huh. And so, and, and it goes into the details of that. And I mean, it, you know, I talk about, when there was, when, you know, we're in the midst of like a resurgence of the racial justice movement, which has been incredibly powerful and really amazing to witness here in New York. And the the rallies and the protests are still going on. And I remember a few weeks ago, I was rounding in my health centers and I was talking to my staff and a lot of my staff are people of color. And a lot of them wanted to, you know, they were just itching to go out and protest, as was I. And, you know, what I told them was, Look, there's a large parallel in the racial justice movement and reproductive justice movement that if an individual is not able to feel safe in their daily lives, feel that they are free from violence and shame and stigma in their daily lives and exercise bodily autonomy, then how are we ever going to feel that we can ever uh, achieve reproductive justice. An individual who we're saying has the right, a black woman who we're saying has the right to conceive and give birth to a child should be able to raise a child and not worry about that child getting shot, right? Not worry about that child um, being, you know, arrested because they're black. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're intricate links into like the work that we do in a day to day and like, you know, the larger racial justice movement. And so I don't know, I could talk. No, I'm glad we tied it back into that. Yeah. We could, we could go on for hours on just the racial socioeconomic sides of abortion, but we'll save that for another time. Um, And I think that's a good place to wrap up if you feel comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Any like final thoughts in terms of um, your patients or what you do or women who are thinking about this? Um, Yeah. I mean, I think uh, there's so much to cover and I, and even, you know, after, after I wrote the book, I was like, gosh, I should have touched on this or I should have touched on that. And I did try to get into the nuances, into the weeds as much as possible, because I think that the the quote that I have in the very beginning of the book, um, you know, it's from Audre Lorde and it says that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, that we need to really move away from this idea that abortion happens in a silo and like that there's a human being that is attached to that experience and who, you know, who comes at the abortion with all these intersections that we may or may not know, but we have to acknowledge they do probably exist. And, you know, I hope that everyone reads this book and, um, and I hope that it opens up important conversations and that it portrays abortion as the human right that it is um, and that the critical health care issue that it is. Yeah. So. We're going to have you tell everybody um, where they can find that. And I just want to thank you for being so open and honest about all these things. And um, I love that we just promoted that there should be no, no shame in this and it should be done in a, a safe and healthy way. And there's lots of options and resources but um, no shame or stigma should ever be attached to this, whatever you're going through. Yeah. Well, thank you again. And again, the book is not out yet. It's September 1st. 
but can you pre-order it? So you can definitely pre-order it okay. wherever books are sold. Okay. Um, I want to put in a plug for independent um, yes. booksellers, okay. um, preferably black or brown owned. Um, it is also available at every you know major book outlet. Um, and yeah, it's, I have a website um, with all the various places you can get it. But oh, good. I was yeah. like, so just well, what's go the to website? website? Yeah, it's you're the only one I've told. Okay. Com. Oh, awesome. Okay, <laughs> great. great. Well, check out that website, you guys. Pre-order the book. And while we're talking about websites, check out our glam new website at girlsgottoeatpodcast.com. And we're Girls Gotta Eat Podcast on Instagram. I'm Ash Hess on Instagram. Raina is Raina.Greenberg. Girls underscore gotta eat on Twitter and YouTube.com slash girls gotta eat. And thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, have a good week, guys. Bye. (laughs) 